I'm Tony Esselin. And I'm Amy Bernard. And we are here to help make it make sense. This is the podcast that takes complicated science and breaks it down into easy to understand language. So buckle up, buttercups. You are in for a bumpy ride. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. And uh, we are joined with yet another premier, premier, top tier guest. We have with ourselves today, Kathy Rivera, who is uh, the executive director and CEO of North Shore Child and Family Guidance Center. Um, Ms. Rivera earned her bachelor's degree at Hunter and uh, the, the City University of New York and her master's of social work from the Hunter College Social of School. Blah. I'm going to just cut this out and start all over. Sure. Um, so uh, Kathy Rivera is the executive director and CEO of North Shore Child and Family Guidance Center. She earned her bachelor's degree from Hunter College, the City University of New York, and her master's of social work from Hunter College School of Social Work. She has over 23 years of experience as a social worker, along with an expertise in management. She has deep, deep, deep knowledge of clinical treatment, mental health policy, and agency operations, and provides profound insights and perspective in the ever-changing landscape of mental health. Um, she has a particular interest in pediatrics. Um, which is why she is here today to talk to us about the mental health of our pediatric uh, population. Um, she took the leadership role at the Guidance Center in June of 2021 and has been managing operations of the agency during the unprecedented mental health crisis brought on by the pandemic. Um, so we are super excited to have you, Miss Rivera. Kathy Rivera, happy to have you here on Help Make It Make Sense. Thank you for joining us. How are you today? I am doing well, and I'm excited to be here. Um, you know, for those who may not see us, based on my voice, you could tell I'm only 25. So, you know, understand I'm a, I'm practically a product of Mensa and started my career practically in utero. So, um, pleasure to be here and share my knowledge. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Um, as you all know, uh, Amy is not here today. Um, but we had to uh, carry on, but she's here in spirit. She was able to, to say hello, um, but we're going to carry on and just talk between us um, about what's going on in children's health, especially when it comes to the mental health impacts um, and well-being of the COVID pandemic. So in general, we wanted to kick off by asking you uh, a question. So the first thing is, how do you know if your child is depressed? So, you know, that as simple as that question uh, is, um, it's difficult, right? Because um, when we, all right, let's just, for, for depression, right? Like, let, let's just define it, right? Here's a fancy schmancy term, and it comes from Webster Dictionary, depression. <laughs> it's defined as a long lasting state of feeling sad. Let's just take apart that for a moment. Kids feel sad. Kids are going to feel sad. Adults will feel sad. I think knowing when um, it's critical, if you will, um, is knowing your child. And for those who are listening, understand that when you're a parent, you're the one in the driver's seat. You're the subject matter expert. T Dr. Esselin, myself, someone who has years and years of experience, will never have the knowledge and understanding of your child as you do. So I think when you 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 are talking about your own child and knowing um, when to understand the signs and symptom of sadness, um, it really depends on your child. Every child is not a one size fits all. Um, it's looking around and monitoring um, things like their sleeping patterns, their eating patterns, um, the changes in what you knew as their baseline, a shift in that, um, uh, looking at um, them being more worried more than usual, their ability to interact with their with others, their ability to connect with others, their ability to connect with you might have shifted. So I think, you know, the gamut of what it looks like in each child is really going to be different. Here's the bottom line. If you are a caregiver, because I don't always want to say parent, because you're not always the biological parent that's caring for that child, right? It takes a village. Um, 
But if your spidey senses are off, as it normally is for kids, because we're always worried about protecting them, right? It's a full-time job, even when they're in front of you or not. Um, I think when your spidey senses are up and you're feeling something is different in that child, even though you may not be able to label it, identify it, um, that's the time to start asking questions. That's the time to start monitoring very closely. That's the time to say, hmm, why am I feeling this way? Why am I noticing something different? Why am I feeling something is different? And you yourself as a caregiver, will need to try to find the words for it because I'll tell you the child won't find won't know the words for it it's up to you to be able to say what is it can I describe it um, and the, and then sort of deconstruct it and sort of take it from there yeah I love what you're saying there in terms of you know know that you know your child better than anyone if and if you feel like something is off, you know, that's when it's the time to to seek help and also not only seek the help, but advocate if you feel like you're not getting the answers that that you that you uh, that you want, right? You have to keep asking questions um and keep advocating on behalf of your child because you're the one who knows them the best. I, I love that um so much. And so how can how can I help uh, if my child is showing signs of depression? So I think the first thing is um, you definitely want to, before you even jump to the professional help, right? You know, I, I think stay with your subject matter expert of your child, right? So um, first and foremost, take stock of your own self, I think, as a caregiver. I think sometimes what we see in our child may be a presentation in what's us as well. Um, and so you, before you're ready, to, think of the oxygen mask, right? Before you're ready to help them, you have to find out where you're at with this, right? Because I think sometimes it's easy to get distracted and say, oh, I'm going to focus all my energy on my child because they're the ones in crisis at this time. But if you yourself are in crisis as well, um, you're going to get them the help they need and that's okay, but you're not really solving the source of possibly where the crisis may be coming from. So I just kind of, you know, I, I don't, for those who are listening, I don't want you to walk away um, as a caregiver thinking you are the crux of the issue. What I'm saying is if you are going to be part of this healing journey, you've got to be in a place where you're also sort of getting your needs met and, and being taken care of, right? Um, but as far as helping, um, I, I think um, going back to using your relationship um, with the child, I think open communication, I think as parents, we're scared to have the dialogue with our child at times, when we see things that are alarming, because we're fearful that we may introduce a concept to the child, or bring unnecessary fear onto the child by asking questions. Um, we're always worried, I think, as caregivers of getting it wrong. Um, and I think, you know, there is no such thing as getting it wrong, right? Because life is not a straight line. Your relationship with your child is not a straight line. Um, I think being able to be open and honest um, and, and saying to your child and asking your child, um, I see something is, 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 is um, different and I'm worried. And do you see it the same way? Um, so I think, you know, there's no, there's no sort of magic pill. I think it comes down to open communication, honesty. Um, and as caregivers, we, we're, we're not really good at this. Talking less, asking a question and silencing yeah. and sitting with the silence, even if a kid brushes it off, depending on their age, right? And their language skills. No, nothing. I don't know. Sitting with that for just a moment and being able to say, well, try, can you use your words and try to help me understand? Because I think being able to help is, I, I think learning as, let me take this back, learning as much as you can will guide you on what help to seek. Um, but I think that is something as caregivers, we're not so good at. We want to rush to the let's just get it away, you know, get it over with. Let me just stop this, right? My child is constantly worried about something. My child is constantly stressed about something. My goal becomes get rid of that. And let's not forget, worry and stress, not negative things in this world. In fact, sometimes it keeps us so safe that we don't even realize how valuable it is. 
Yeah. Wow. What I want you to expand a little bit on on some of the things that you said. So you you were talking about um you know uh not introducing a concept. Mm -hmm. Be fearful about intro Can you talk a little bit more about that and 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 do you have some tools around stuff because that is very prevalent in the pediatric population in terms of like trying to talk to parents about maybe a condition or, you know, or, um, an experience, um, and trying to get them to, to, to vocalize and express, you know, maybe what it is that they're feeling. And that comes up a lot about, I don't want to introduce these concepts, you know, right. especially, you know, with some of the concepts that are, that are um, out there in the media at the moment. Um, and so, uh, talk a little bit more about that and, and, and how that's maybe a myth that you'd like to bust. Yeah. So um, I'm going to, you know what, I'd like to use two things, right, in giving an example. And they may be extreme for those who are listening, um, but I think that they give a good illustration. Um, Self-harming and suicide. Parents don't ever love to introduce that topic or say anything because the fear is I'm going to in introduce a behavior or something my child may not have ever been thinking about by simply just asking them. And the myth behind that is um, if a child is harming themselves or thinking about harming themselves or thinking about taking their lives, I assure you, you as their parent, just simply bringing up a conversation will not just pop that idea into their head and say, you know, I really wasn't thinking about that before, but thanks for that idea. I think I'm going right. to go and try it now, right? right? You know, if, 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 um, you know, I, I think, and, and, I, and I apologize if I'm using such an extreme example, but I notice, you know, those are really critical, risky behaviors that are really prevalent in our young people. You know, to dr throw a little data out there, suicide is the second leading cause of death in children ages 10 to 24. And we all know 18 to 24 young people are still living a pediatric lifestyle. So even though on paper that's as an adult, we know that um, they, they are not living an adult lifestyle. And I will tell you that age 10 as sort of the benchmark is getting younger and younger. So what does that mean? If it's the second leading cause in, in the United States, we have a chance to do something about it, right? The, the you know, and, and, and the, the young people who are taking their lives, um, I assure you were not introduced to that concept by their caregiver, right? There were a lot of precipitating factors. Um, violence, um, you, know, uh, you know, especially amongst children and I think just across, you know, um, the United States is a big fear factor of adults. Um, you know, especially with violence amongst young people being sort of the instigator of that with a weapon, <laughs> even more specifically. Um, I think the fear of asking a child, um, you know, are, are you having so much difficulty managing your emotions that you want to harm yourself or harm others? I think the fear of asking that question um, with caregivers is very prevalent because nobody wants to be the parent of a child that causes physical harm and danger to others and let alone the, themselves, right? Because what happens when, if that occurs? There's the shame that gets associated with it um, as a caregiver. There's the stigma that gets associated with it. Um, and you know, feeling like you failed your child is not something that you want to ever be confronted with. Um, so I think, you know, being able to communicate and talk about difficult things um, is something, it's a skill. It's a skill that not all of us have, even as professionals, being able to introduce an uncomfortable, difficult concept or difficult conversation that yikes, I may not have all the answers for is really, um, is really, is really challenging um, for professionals, let alone caregivers who may not feel that they have the tools to do so. Yeah, that's I said a lot. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> great. No, but it's heavy stuff. And it's stuff that, you know, we toss and turn about as parents, um, as caregivers, and we don't really even know how to begin. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that um, I think those of us who are in pediatrics or who deal with pediatrics, even before COVID, we were dealing with this difficulty, 
right? We were just, it was already, and now COVID, right? Like, and isolation and homeschooling and, you know, all of the dynamics that come with some of the homes that may not have been, you know, um, stable, right? Um, and so how how do you feel, you know, what's changed for you as a, as a, I'm going off script here a little bit, sure, but like, sure. how, how, how did this, how did this change the landscape of mental health for pediatrics from where you sit, right? Because we already had a problem, you know, and we talked a little bit about this in other podcasts, like in terms of workforce stress and burnout, we already had a problem before COVID and COVID just was a pressure cooker that just like exacerbated all of the weaknesses and fragilities that we had. It just, it just stomped on them <laughs> and, and exploded um, all of the issues and brought everything to the forefront that a lot of us were already battling. And so like, how did it, how did it affect the work that you do um, and the patients that you take care of? Yeah. So, you know, I, I appreciate the word that you use exacerbated because I want to be very clear. This was a pressure cooker um, uh, that occurred well before the pandemic and the explosion just, I think, happened at the pandemic. Okay. So um, I, I do want to give uh, COVID credit, which is not often what you hear in a sentence, where it gave us permission to talk about things. So you heard me talk before about caregivers feeling shame and stigma when their child is not well, right? Because you're, it's your job as a caregiver to keep your child well. And That's when right. their chi your child is not well, you can't help but to feel it's a reflection of me. Somehow I played a role in it, right? And I, I missed a step. I didn't do something right. Shame on me. Luckily with COVID, you had something to sort of point to, right? Not it. I didn't cause this, but oh my gosh, I'm a victim of it as is my child, right? And that's a little bit more digestible, right? Gives you, self, you, you permission. Um, now, as far as my own um, professional experience with it, um, we are seeing younger and younger people walk through our doors, uh, not being able to manage their emotions in the same way. Um, we're seeing more behavioral issues, um, an inability to connect with their peers, an inab inability to concentrate in school, and quite honestly, not finding as much joy in things. What I'm finding also very interestingly um, is a real fear around climate change. I have been finding that our young people, really? particularly Yes, particularly adolescents, those who are transitioning to adolescents, parents that are getting frustrated or not knowing what to do with conversations from their young people, um, critical ages, usually about 12, 13 and up saying, kids, why? What planet are my grandchildren going to have? Why am I worried about having kids? No way. Thank you. Not it for me. You, you know, you know. Your generation, of course, we get blamed for everything, um, <laughs> destroyed it. And we're we're busting our butts to fix it. And I don't know what quality of life my own children are going to have, my grandchildren, or even myself as an adult. So there's this incredible worry and fear and anger mm -hmm. um, and sort of checking out in some ways, right, that we're seeing with some of our young people, which is an interesting, um, we're, we're, we're confronted with interesting variables, right? So we're, we're, with our young people walking through our doors, working and focusing on healing and building hope for a promising future. Mm -hmm. Yet everything that's in the media between the violence, between, you know, if you look at the immigrant um, uh, population and the struggles and food insecurity and safety being compromised in a variety of ways. We're trying to build this 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 um, notion of hope and healing, and they can't even see past tomorrow as being hopeful. That's amazing. Um, right. So yeah. so we're we're seeing a lot of that right coming in our doors. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, younger people saying um, they want to kill themselves, um, not really with the notion of it and understanding the totality of it, but really just saying, 
I kind of don't like this life. I kind of don't like this lifetime. I don't, I kind of don't want to be a part of it because I'm not loving what I'm seeing right now, but not knowing the words, right. And not knowing how to talk through that and just saying, you know, I'd rather just not kind of be here, right? It's it's kind of like a TikTok reel. I don't want to see this. I'll just move on to another reel, right? That brings me joy, right? Kind of like that that concept of just being able to shift in and out of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're seeing more and more of that. We're seeing more and more of um, caregivers in what I like to describe in as the snack back phase. So a lot of them in their own professional lives have had to snap back, right? Um, some of them have come back into the office, have the, it's business as usual, right? The isolation is gone. It's not in the same way. Um, and so they're practicing their own lives that way. And they are, they're, they, they're putting that adult expectation on their children. Just go back to school. School's open. Your masks aren't on. It's fine. You don't have to do uh, six feet anymore. Go back you know, who says that the pandemic is over, knock it off. Like it's fine. Stop being scared. Mm -hmm. um, and kids don't have right. Their frontal cortex, right. Isn't, isn't fully functioned then. Right. By then. Um, so they're not able to reason and think it away and will it away the same way adult and adult can. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been, a I think it's my long winded way of saying our work with our families has shifted drastically because mm -hmm. while a child may come through our doors in need of help you're working with the family ecosystem right mm -hmm. to build and provide that help um and and the work with our families has become more challenging as well i would say my goodness wow well i just learned something y'all i didn't know climate change was weighing heavily on our adolescence that's that's very interesting it that's has very interesting it's in, it's it's contributed to a different kind of worry, stress, and anxiety. Mm. Um, that is not something that I can easily say that our generation, nor have we saw, seen it in our clinics before. Right. Oh, um, we interesting. we well, have some kids that um uh actually I'm sorry to cut you off. We have some kids um young young right so you know um who don't want to go to school when it rains heavily because they freak out about the flooding. They, um, right, they, they may, um, they've seen the footage, they've seen the danger, they've seen people die from getting stuck in their car during a significant rainfall. And so they say, no, no, thank you. I'm not going to school today. It's raining heavily. Sorry. Um, well, yeah. you know, this is something that, um, you know, again, we're, 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 uh, going a little off script, but it's, it's literally like one of the things that we talk about in our professional circles with regard to access to information and the, and the ease to which young people can get their hands on information that like our generation, we were shielded, right? Like it was, if it wasn't on the news, we didn't see it, you know? Um, and at that time, a lot of the times we'd be asleep, <laughs> you know, or we'd be told to go to our rooms or whatever. And now you can bring that stuff with you to your room. Um, you know, the phone, the iPad, whatever it is to get to access information. And so shielding our youth from a lot of the trials and tribulations of the world, but it's not like the trials and tribulations of the world have changed. It's the same. It's the same stuff that's been happening since the beginning of time. Um, I think that what we're realizing is that the exposure of these tragedies um, is 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 a lot more than what we've dealt with beforehand, and it's affecting them. It's affecting them in ways that we just didn't we just didn't anticipate. Um, but we have to figure out a way that to 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 stem it. And I think that uh, parents really struggle with, you know, the screen time. You know, we as pediatricians are always like, you know, make sure that you don't have more than three hours a week <laughs> on screen time. But it's like, you know, you, when you're busy and your kid is screaming mommy, mommy, mommy in your ear and you can keep them quiet for an hour. So like you can cook, you can clean, you can do your job, whatever it is that you're doing, have peace. You're going to give them the screen. Like that's just the reality of it. And shaking your finger is just not, it's not a helpful, it's not a helpful practice. Um, but what are we going to do? Like, <laughs> how are we going to, 
how, what do we do? Like, how do you, you have a child who comes to you, who's got all of these anxieties because of the exposure of information. And it's really hard to control and limit the exposure of information in the world that we live in, right? Like and some people are successful. I, I've met a couple of people who are like, they call themselves screen free. And I'm like, that's, a, that's amazing. How do you manage that? You know? Um, so I don't know. I'm just babbling now, but I, I what, what do we do? What yeah, do we- no, you're, you're not babbling, right? So, so let's go back to basics, right? Because, you know, instead of boiling the ocean, right, let's try, let's try to go back to basics. So, you, you know, I, I laughed when you, you know, you said, um, uh, you know, you, you talked about, you know, we didn't have um, access to this being younger, right? And now kids nowadays have access to everything. Um, let's just go back to basics for, uh, right now and talk about, you know, inner outer, right? When, when your inner is okay, right? Your thought processes are going to be different. Um, and so let's just focus on sort of um, sleep patterns and food for just a second, right? When you and I grew up, even though I'm only 25, you and I grew up, television, right? With our four channels, um, right? Four what channels. Ha- we had our Kung Fu Saturdays. Right. Right. Love that. No, no. And, but what happened, right? You yeah. had those, it's 10 PM. Do you know where your child is? And, yeah. and what happened around 11 o'clock? You had nothing but the black screen on the TV. Every channel you would try to press all you would see is black screen, Ooh, right? You could, girl, you could. I don't think that you can convince anybody that you're only 25 now, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right. And 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 we didn't. We were none the wiser, right? So so what did that mean? What was the real purpose of having sort of that 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 screen go offline? It wasn't because somebody clocked out. It wasn't because it was because people were expected to sleep at that time, right? So it would knock off this time and come back at another time. I think sleeping patterns for kids, you know, um, is is something that as as caregivers we have to pay very very close attention to. Um, I think you know, you know, th- that exposure to the the light right from their screens, and you know this. I'm talking to a doctor, right? Um, keeps their sort of adrenaline and keeps them alert and keeps them kind of going nonstop. So I think, look, rather than trying to boil the ocean and saying, oh, my God, let me follow the pediatrician and, you know, um, only do two hours a day because if I don't, I'm a bad parent. Let's just start with basics and say, you know what, there's going to be a cutoff time at night and a start time in the morning and try to stretch that out. Right. Don't try to just say, oh, my goodness, you know, like I, I no, no, no screens during dinner time. Oh, my God, I screwed that up. They had the screen this time. I screwed up as a parent. Damn it. I missed the mark. Start with just some basics, right? Let them sleep. Make sure you have a routine where not just you, the family commits and puts, you know, their devices in an isolated place at a certain time to say, I don't care what happens in this world. From this time to this time, I'm going to commit myself to sleep, right? As a family and as a community. I think food is also um, a big thing. I think that, you know, our young people are so stuck on screens that they're multitasking and they're not really getting the nutrition that they need. And I'll tell you as adults too, I'm guilty of it. I sit at work and I eat during, um, through my lunch while checking my emails. Horrible, horrible. I had no time to hit a reset button. Right. Um, So I think, you know, these little tiny practices that we as adults can do, um, if we can get ourselves to do it, we can then teach our children to do it. But it starts with us and it ends with us. And I think it's easier said than done. And again, we want children to act like little mini adults when we ourselves can't sort of control our own behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, for for parents and caregivers that are listening, this is not to demonize, it's to humanize it. And Mm -hmm. to say, start with us. Don't, don't go, don't jump to your child immediately. Start with yourself. Get yourself to where you would like yourself to be. And then translate that to your child. I think we get distracted with what's in front of us. Very well, often. I mean, the, the same way that you're saying that you're seeing an increase in anxiety and depression and um and uh, other mental health illnesses in 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 your children, I mean in adults, it's just this, it's exactly the same. It's a reflection, right? It's a pool, it's a reflection pool. And I think that um you know there's just so much like our lives are just so chaotic and so and so stressful. Um, 
that we just, you know, and, and this is the, in the negative way, like to your point, like a little bit of stress and anxiety or whatever, sometimes you, it's what you need to motivate you depending on who you are, right? Like some people can use it and be productive and some people it just, it sets them back, you know, but, <clears throat> but uh, I love what you're saying about, you know, starting from scratch. It's kind of the conversation I give to my patients about exercise. <laughs> it's like, your thing is sleep, right? My thing is exercise. And it's like, look, you know, little by little, like you can't just weekend warrior this and then think that you're going to be able to continue and manage this, right? Like um, as a lifestyle, it's something that you have to do little by little so that it's not overwhelming. Um, and then also if you have a setback, don't blame yourself for it. Just pick it up again. Just start, just try again. Um, and, but I love that I actually am going to use that. I think that's really important about sleep and prioritizing sleep um, and how, it, it helps you kind of rest, even if you're, even if you're not asleep, just the act of laying down without a distraction, um, can be, can be soothing and healing and, and can start the process of you kind of reprogramming your circadian rhythm really, um, to getting you back into a sleep cycle that's actually helpful to you, um, for rest and, and heal. I love that. I think that's such a great such a great little pearl. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. And and it's cost effective, right? It doesn't yeah. come with a co it doesn't come with a copay. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> exactly. Everybody can do it. Um I, you know, we're talking a lot about stress and I and I, you know, again, I want the caregivers, I know what I'm talking a lot about the caregivers, and this is the context of children, but I want caregivers to really understand, and this is hard to hear, that sometimes you yourself as the adult and the caregiver are the very source of stress for your mm. children. Mm. And I know that that is hard to hear and people may say, well, what are you talking about? Just, just understand, when, you, when I talked earlier about taking stock of your own stress, taking stock of how it impacts your own well-being, your ability to think, your ability to stay present in the moment, your ability to get exercise in your own life, your food consumption, your sleep cycles, your ability to relate and have romantic and healthy um, interactions with others, um, whether it be coworkers, whether it be your loved ones, whether it be your children. When you start to compartmentalize that and grade yourself in those areas, if you honestly grade yourself, let me be very clear about that, um, when you are vulnerable like that and you start to do that and you find that your scoring isn't where you would like it to be, understand how that affects those within your ecosystem. And I'm not even just talking about your child. I'm talking about those, you, if you're a working person, those who you work with, those who you may encounter in your community. Um, and if they're not favorable, understand, I'm not blaming you as the individual. I'm saying you could be part of that source of stress. Um, and so help yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't like it, um, if, you do, if you don't want to be that, if you find, oh my goodness, that is not the unintended consequence that I want, understand that you've got to do that work with yourself too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really not easy to acknowledge, not easy to accept, just to veer off script for a minute, it's even harder in women mm. because we are the superheroes. Heaven forbid, we don't have that superpower today. Oh, wow. We do a mental gymnastics and beat ourselves up. We, mm. we beat ourselves up. We don't beat our partners up. Nope. We, don't, we don't blame, you know, our, our partners for it. We, we blame ourselves for it, right? Because it's easier to do. Right. <laughs> Right. And we're holding ourselves up to this standard, the societal standard that was made 150 years ago, <laughs> you know, and it's not, we haven't updated it. We just haven't updated it. You know, we haven't updated our, um, our work, the way that we work. We haven't updated the way that we live. We just haven't updated it. It's like, we're trying to, to uh, achieve this you know, nirvana of motherhood or of parenthood, if you will, um, that's just, it's just, it's impossible sometimes right. in, the, in the society in which we're living. And, and we don't, 
um, we're not giving ourselves enough grace um, with that. And then it all of that tension transmits to the child. Like it just does, right? Like there's nothing there's nothing you can do about that. If you're anxious, you transmit that right. anxiety and those feelings of negativity. Like that's just a very powerful emotion um, that just, you know, what is it like reverberates <laughs> around, yes. you, you know, um, and vibrates really. Right. Um, and, and uh, can you could, you can actually see it in your pets too. Sometimes for those of yeah. you who are pet lovers, yeah. you, you can see the, the energy that is emitted in your um personal space mm -hmm. gets, you know, permeated, right. Mm -hmm. And can be transferred to others um, unknowingly. Right. You know, I mean, right. this is why we're more complex than animals, right? Because right. We, we bring a plethora of emotions. Are we? Are we? <laughs> in some, in some ways, a little. in some ways we are a little bit. So I think what's really, um, what can we do to help your your child cope besides dealing with it yourself right. um, and dealing it with your like now what do you do to help your child cope and and how do you help how do you recognize when your child is experiencing stress and 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 what does that look like for them yeah so so let's deconstruct this right so so first is going back to 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 if if your spidey senses are up and you're noticing something do all you can to learn learn about what some of those symptoms are, right? Or, or no, not, not symptoms, what the possible source or sources could be. Um, I think, you know, stress looks very different in each child. It could look like um, a physical manifestation, right? So you may see them being um, a little bit more sad, um, a little bit more worried. Um, they may talk about tummy aches. I don't feel well, right? A little, you know, um, of a physical reaction. You might even see sort of a regression. Um, so they, uh, for the young younger kids, especially if they've um, hit certain milestones, you might see things like bedwetting again, right? You might see um, a change in their sleep patterns. You might see some weight loss, right? A change in their eating patterns. So there are things that you should, uh, that are, are, are kind of blatant. Um, and then there are things that are a little bit more subtle, right? A little bit of more withdrawing, not wanting to engage with others, not wanting to engage in social interactions, um, not wanting to engage in things that used to be a source of joy for them. Um, and sort of tapping out from that. Um, so being able to kind of keep your keep your eye out for some of those things. Um, and so in terms of coping, right, you know, I mean, obviously, there's a professional help for that, right? If, if you feel like I just don't know what to do, definitely uh, reach out. Uh, definitely reach out to your support system. Ask other parents. I know sometimes we get really scared to ask other parents because we think if I ask, I'm revealing that something's wrong, that there's some stuff going on in my own home. Um, and so there's that fear of airing your dirty laundry. Um, listen, newsflash, we're never going to naturalize this if we don't talk about it, right? The pandemic helped us naturalize it. As a caregiver, just ask. Don't worry about the stigma. Um, don't worry about being judged. Just the hardest thing to do, look, look at the hardest thing to do is ask for help. Look at it instead of a, as a negative thing, as a brave thing. How brave were you to say, wow, I can't do this and I need to ask for help. Um, as far as coping, I think there's a, a, a lot of things that you can do, I think, as a, a caregiver. Um, turn on the love meter a little bit higher, right? Um, be more affectionate. Um, introduce language to your kids that they may not have had. Um, when talking about stress and anxiety, don't make it dirty little words, make it part of the, their vocabulary. Um, for the younger ones, especially, I think it's wonderful to read books together um, surrounding depression, um, anxiety and stress and helping them understand what it could look like in for, for them so that way they know, oh, it's not just me. Um, you know, this I'm not alone in this feeling. It's actually um, something that other people feel. Uh, I also think um, being able to create a, a sense of calm around them, um, but not finding the answers for it, asking them what, what, what does a world of calm look like for them? 
what does a, a world of safety look like for them and ask them what they what what that entails um because they may introduce concepts to you as a as the parent that you didn't even realize it could be something as simple as noise oh when it's quieter okay well you live in a home that's a little bit noisier be mindful of that right take right. take stock create special space for both of you to say, you know what, we need some quiet time. Let's find a place in this home where we will experience quiet time together. Do you like certain smells that that would kind of bring you peace and calm, right? Sounds kind of cheesy, sounds kind of basic, but guess what? These are things that you can actually do. Sometimes the very answers on how your ch- you can help your child cope are within them. Mm. Give them some credit. Oh, I right? love that. Give them some credit. Sometimes we think as adults, we are supposed to know the answers. Let me tell you, those little people, very wise for their years. They are. (laughs) Sometimes they reveal things that you're like, wow, the simplest answer is the best answer. And I had no idea. That's right. Oh, I love that. I Use your that. child as your little encyclopedia, I tell you. I think that's such a great, that's such a great frame, right? Like it doesn't have to always come from you. Like ask them, like, what do you want to do? Like, where do you want to go? And maybe it's not even something that's that hard. You know, a lot of the times they're very easy to please in certain things, but we're not asking them. We're assuming what they want um, based on the way we grew up and the things that we wanted when we were their age. But it's like, they're all individuals and different and they have their own um, needs. I think that's just, um, that's really, really, uh, really smart. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, one of the things that, uh, that was born out of this podcast was just, um, trying to get folks over the anxiety of vaccination and this new things about vaccination. And what do you, what is your approach to, uh, children who have, um, anxiety around getting vaccinated or parents who have anxieties about getting vaccinated. Um, some folks just don't like needles. Like, you know, my son, you've, you've heard those stories. Like he will karate chop you in the neck if you try, <laughs> try to give him a shot, <laughs> you know? So, um, but what if, I'm just curious, like, what is your, what is your approach to, to uh, that type of uh, anxiety? Again, you know, I, I think it goes back to constant communication and education. I, I think, you know, do you want to get it right? Or do you want to get, are you going for speed or do you want to get it right? And I think sometimes as parents, especially when it comes to a vaccination, um, you know, the fear is I got to make this decision. I got to make this decision now. Right. And all you, the, the hesitation, let's be clear around it comes from an emotion. And what do we know about emotions? They don't turn on, they don't turn off. Right. Just like that, like a switch. So I think constant education around it, constant discussion around it. Um, Power is a big thing when it comes to this, right? Um, Being, you know, again, making sure that parents, if whether you're a medical provider um, or just, you know, a confidant, um, making sure that the parent always feels like they're in the driver's seat with this and not, you know, forcing them to to sort of um, see a side that you want them to see. I think just allowing them to say, you know what, this is going to be your decision at the end of the day. And 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 there's no right or wrong decision. There's only your decision, right? And here's the bottom line. You're, whatever you do, you do for love. And we know that. And there's no doubt about that. And so what every decision that you make, whatever your decision matrix is, however you come to that, we know that you're doing it for love for your child. Um, and so um, understand that, you know, you are going to have curiosity, you're going to have um, uh, suspicion, you're going to right, you know, I think introduce all those those emotions in those conversations, right? So, so you can kind of ease them and say, look, these are natural. If you're not having them, it's weird if you don't have these kinds of emotions when it comes to making a critical decision for your child, particularly around medicine, right? Because I think to your point, you said it earlier, you've got this social media out there that you know, is sharing so much misinformation um, that there's this mental gymnastics that's going on in these in caregivers heads, and they don't want to make the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. And we understand that and we have to have empathy around that. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, I think what it comes down to is education, constant communication and patience. Mm -hmm. Um, That that that's kind of, you know, that's the secret sauce. (laughs) That's that's what it is. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. Um, And I think that like one of the, 
one of the things that I battle a lot in my practice, and um, I'm sure that comes, you know, I, I actually wonder how it how it actually comes down to you because my my side as a primary care doctor is trying to get them in the door to get to come to you. Um, but it's the stigma. It's the whole, I'm gonna, you know, I don't, I don't want to label my child, especially children, right? Like they don't want to label their kids. Um, they don't want, um, you know, their, uh, if, if a child needs medication or if there is a requirement for medication, like there's a lot of hesitation around that. Um, and even for the adult, right? Like they are going through a lot of, of those emotions. And one of the things I, I want to just share this piece, and then I'm, I'm really interested in your, in your perspective is, one thing that people don't understand about um, mental health um, uh, treatments is that it can be, it's multifactorial. It's not just one size fits all. It depends on what you need, right? And we can always start off with, let's do some talk therapy and get you to like open up and try to see if you can verbalize exactly what it is that's bothering you, triggering you, all the things, right? Um, but start to talk about it. You know, and if you're in a really bad spot, what people don't understand, and I like to share with my patients is like, this is an episode, like this is not something that necessarily is going to last forever. And in order for you to, to get over it, sometimes we can help with medication. And it doesn't mean that just because you get medication, that you're attached to medication forever. <laughs> like this doesn't mean, it just means maybe it's a few months and then we can take you off of it and see how you do, see if you're better, right? Because you're trying to get through an episode. And so there's no one size fits all for mental health, um, but like getting through, getting through the whole stigma piece of it, of like now, oh my gosh, now I have depression. No, I reject that. I, not, I am not depressed. I just need to get over it. And I just need to, you know, pray it away. Or I need to just, you know, take a walk and I'll be fine. And I just need to get over it. I'm just being, I'm being selfish, you know, that kind of conversation. Um, how do you break through that? And, you know, what is your recommendation for folks who are just, they know that something's not right. They're not happy with where they're off, where, where they are. They've been told that maybe perhaps therapy could be helpful to them, but they reject it because they don't want to be associated with that. What What is your approach to that? I know I said a lot, but um, wanted to turn that over to you. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, first and foremost, um, it's, it's credible messengers like you and I that are constantly, um, getting the word out. So, so I think, you know, first and foremost is those who can effectuate change in this industry need to, especially those who are people of color. Um, that's, that, that is, you know, for anyone who's listening, um, whether you're in this industry or not, the more you can, communicate and talk about it and encourage people to um, access um, this kind of help is is first and foremost. Um, I think, you know, on my side, which is a little different from the physical um, level of services is, you know, it's all about connection with people, right? So people who walk through the door who are just like, I'm not, you know, I'm not um, feeling well, I want some help with that. But don't you dare talk to me about medication, right? We have a lot of families that come in, um, in that um, mindset. And here's, you know, here's what is, you know, going back to basics, you can, you constantly hear me saying that it's called about the, it, it comes down to the therapeutic relationship, which unlike in the medical profession, you don't get to create that on day one, right? They come to you for something very acute and, and, and unfortunately you gotta fix it right for, before it gets exacerbated. Right. right. In my world, and this is, you know, and I'm, I, I call it a privilege to be able to do this is we have time to build that, right? So on day one, when someone's saying, I'm worried about my child, they, 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 they're they not interacting with peers and they're not going to school. What we get to do is we get to build a relationship, right? Because we, we make it very clear to the parents. Um, I'm, you know, we understand school avoidance is an issue. I'll, I'll just say with that example for a minute, understand talking to me for 45 minutes is not gonna get them to go back to school tomorrow. So let's just level set the expectations right there, right? Mm -hmm. I've got to get to the root of why they hate school so much. And you haven't been able to do that. I appreciate you trusting me with that. Now let's work together 
to figure out how we can combat that, right? And so the therapeutic relationship is key, you know, going back to basics with compassion and empathy. Um, you know, I'm not going to get you to change any of your behaviors if I haven't connected with you right here in the heart, right? I am not going to, on a cerebral level, connect with you if I don't feel you have my best interest in mind. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of our work, what we try to do, whether we're, we're successful in engaging them in treatment or keeping them long enough, is letting them know that there is a connection there um, and that we're here from them. We, we, we also use um, a lot of uh, what I like to say are credible messengers as young people. We try to create youth ambassadors from our work um, to be able to connect to those young people as well who walk through the door because they're not going to listen to an elderly person like me. Right. Right. They're they're going to live. I thought you were 25. I know, but I'm 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 old for a 14 year old. You know, I'm just saying um, they think I'm old. Um, but anyway, <laughs> they think I'm ready for Social Security. Seriously, they do. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I, got you. I got you. But being able to use also folks with, you know, for young people who walk through our door to say, listen, I'm here because my parents stuck me here. I don't want to be here. Um, but being able to connect them with a young person who, when they walk through our door to say, look, I look like you. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I was skeptical too. I wasn't going to, you know, close my eyes and do some deep breathing and, and think everything was going to be better. Mm -hmm. But being able to say, you know what? I felt like crap. I don't know why I felt like crap. I didn't want to be in school. I didn't want to do this. Um, and being able to say, look, I felt that way too. And I didn't know what was going on. Um, and I... It took me a long time to figure out what was going on mm -hmm. and understand that there's some hope there. Um, I mean, going back to being able to kind of deconstruct the myth and the anxiety around it, that is a that is not an easy answer. It's not a, a you know one size fits all. I mean, here we are in 2023, past the pandemic, celebrities are talking about it people in high flying positions are talking about it and yet there is still stigma and shame that comes with it so we have reached a level that's more advanced but we're nowhere near um eliminating the stigma around it so when you talk about medical health as well and you talk about medical interventions and medicines used to treat it we've got a long way to go Mm -hmm. I wish I could tell you this one podcast or I wish I could tell you, oh, it's these three simple ingredients you use. And then you mean our podcast isn't going to fix it? No, what? no, <gasps> my friend. No, not even this 25 year old is going to fix it. <laughs> I'm so sorry to burst your bubble. <laughs> no, I know. I, you know, I think I love what you've said. And it's kind of, you know, it's a definite check for me, even as a primary care doctor who's like, definitely wants things to be fixed like now, like yesterday and level setting that expectation that like, this is a journey. Like this is a journey. This is a process. Like, you know, if we get you the help that you need, it doesn't mean you're going to feel better tomorrow, but if you stick with it, that's the hard part. That's the hard part with this. It's almost like trying to help somebody with blood pressure issues, right? Like somebody who doesn't feel it, they feel fine. What are you talking about? I'm fine. You know? And it's like, Actually, if you keep staying at this level, you're not going to be fine, you know, and, and, and when you're, when you're not feeling the impact right there, right at that minute, you're not having a stroke, you're not having a heart attack, it's not real to you. And so um, understanding that these things are a process and you have to be patient and invested, man, that's the hard, you have to be invested and committed. And that is hard when when things are just going on in your life you know I, I love the the explanation of the ecosystem right because you just everybody's ecosystem is different and you just don't know what the what the pressures and what the relievers are in that ecosystem for every single person and so um really important to understand that like you know this is the beginning this is a step in making you better a step in making you heal. And we might have hiccups along the way, right? Like it might not work the first couple of times, but if you stick with it, it's like exercise. <laughs> it goes back to that. If you stick with it, you know, eventually you're going to see, um, you're going to see some, some, uh, 
uh, benefits, right? Right. And I and I also wanted to say, you know, as, as caregivers, right, and as professionals, uh, one of the things we have to do, and it's easy to say, hard to do, is is understanding that the the definition and the dimensions of success are all different. Human beings are complex, right? I know for myself as a caregiver, I define um, I define success differently for my kids, and then in my profession, I de- define success very differently, right? And and sometimes I make the mistake of sort of of creating a, a level of success based on my own stuff. Because look, we're humans, right? We bring our stuff to work. Whether we want to say we check, we can we can wink, wink, wink and say, I check it at the door. When yeah. I come in, I'm a professional and yeah. I'm a superhero. <laughs> no, I bring my own stuff. I may right. bring my own trauma histories. I may bring right. whatever right. with me to the door, right? Um, Because I, I, I can't, I'm not, I can't turn it on and off. And so the way we define success and look at success we may see it, and, and this is hard to admit, but it's the truth. We may see it as a failure in ourselves, but it was actually a success in those who we are treating. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just not defined the same way. And so for them, getting getting them to come back to a second session is the big, biggest success. I may look at it as a failure because I'm like, well, that first session, they said like three things. I was the one doing most of the talking. Oh, geez, the engagement's not there. Mm-hmm. When coming back the second session marks engagements and Mm -hmm. and there is some success in there so so we as adults and we as human beings don't take enough time to find joy in those successes we minimize it we push it to the side and we're like not good enough we need more we need more Mm -hmm. right it's it's it's, you know, it's that TikTok reel. That's not funny. Let me go to another one. Okay, that's funny. Okay, let me find a funnier one. Let me find, it's the one up, right? right, we, we, right we're right. never, we're insatiable. We're insatiable creatures. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh man, I love this. I mean, I listen, I as usual, I could talk to you all day <laughs> about all of these things, but this has been such a rich, rich discussion. Thank you so much. I want to respect your time. Um, Thank you for taking the time to, to talk to us here at Help Make It Make Sense. Um, obviously, if you are experiencing any type of uh, health crisis, please seek out help. Um, we'll leave some uh, some connections in the show notes for you. Um, but Kathy Rivera, thank you so much for joining us here today. This was an awesome conversation and hopefully we can have you back. Absolutely. And again, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, you know, it's an honor and a privilege. Um, and those who are listening, you're not alone. That's You're right. not alone. Um, you know, as as full disclosure, I'm I'm a mother who has a child, and I and I'm a professional, and I'm a clinician, and I no one's immune, no one's protected. Um, but the understanding is that there, oh, not not the understanding, understand that there is help. Don't be ashamed. Ask for it. Uh, the worst thing you could do is um, suffer in silence. So That's please right. reach out. That's right. We're here for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Stay safe. Happy Mother's Day, everyone. Happy Mother's Day.